Welcome back, everyone. We are going to continue with Dancing Through Life by Josephine Bradley. And I hope you're enjoying this series. These chapters, some of these are short, some of these are long. So I figured we'd just crush a few at a time and get on with it so you can enjoy the actual uh, lessons there. Look at one of these frocks, right? You can get an idea of what Josephine looks like back in the day. There you go. The original ballroom shoes have not really changed that much. So if you're enjoying this series, give it a like, share, comment, share it with some friends, get some of the history of ballroom dancing inside your cranium, understand how this world evolved, take some lessons from it, take some inspiration from it as well. And hopefully we can all garner some cool insight into one of our shared passions together, okay? And if you'd like me to help you with your ballroom dancing, visit ballroommastery.tv forward slash access. Check it out every week, you and I, bang, every single day, I will give you videos that will help you increase your ballroom dancing skills, take you up to the stratosphere of dancing. I promise you, you will get a lot from this. Plus, every month I do live Q&As with the members all across the world. So there are no stupid questions that you can ask me, just stupid people. All right. So with that in mind, let's crack into chapter five, boom, the blind officers. A very different set of dancing experiences came to me through my connection with Sir Arthur Pearson. This was due to the influence of my friend, Mrs. Murray Atkins, who had come to London to give her services to the home of the blinded officers in Portland Place, organized by Sir Arthur and Lady Pearson. Murray Atkinson's, a little lady in stature, she was not quite five feet, who always reminded me of a piece of Dresden china. Yeah, my mom loves collecting dressed in China. Those are cool dolls, but they're a little creepy. I can see why horror movies are based like, off those. And who, Hitteru, I hate that word. They used that in the first chapter, and I was like, I'm going to sound like a retard right now trying to say that one. Anyway, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm going to ignore it okay? because it was unnecessary. You put that in there for me, Josephine. Had only to run to her own charming house in the country, now took her in a capable small hands of controlling a home for the blinded officers, the VADs, and the personal which uh, and the personnel which go with such establishment. That sounds like pretty cool. It must be, yeah, officers obviously that come back from the war with no sight. She quickly realized that these men shattered and robbed one of their mo- of one of the most essential senses, needed recreation and amusement. And she thought of dancing. Naturally, her mind recalled me, and I was asked to teach them. It's really fascinating. So I had a pupil um, for about, I think about 18 months. It was sort of on and off. His name was Stephen. He was awesome. He came in, and he was he was blind. He couldn't see, obviously. He uh, hit his dog. His dog would sit on the side, and, and he would come uh, with his carer. This dude was better at picking up steps through my vocal instruction than the ones who could see and hear me. He was really, really good like that. And he had this extra sense thing going on that he couldn't, that he, you know, outside of like a, occasional, like, you know, things going a little, bit, a little bit wild, he was incredibly good at maintaining his balance and moving around the floor, coordinated confidently, calmly, and not hitting anyone. It was really quite a, quite a thing, you know. Uh, it was very, very fascinating. On another side note, which has nothing to do with actually being blind, if you want to practice your dancing and truly get a feel when you're ballroom dancing, you can do this in Latin too, for connection with your partner, tape a blindfold around yourself, okay, around your, around your head, right, both of you one at a time for safety, and then both of you do it. And immediately, you, your senses kick in elsewhere, and you can really feel a uh, connection in a different way. Give it a shot. See how you go. Back to the book. Naturally, her mind recalled me, and I was asked to teach them. My favorite pupil there was Ian Fraser, a then tall, fair boy, looking hardly old enough to be been through a war. Yeah, well, that's what they did back then. They chucked all the young kids into war at like 15, 16, 17, 18. Uh, they were not men, not yet. He was subsequently chosen to understudy Sir Arthur Pearson, and on the latter's death, took his place. And today, or well, back then, is well-known Lieutenant Colonel Sir Ian Fraser, MP, head of St. Dustin's. He married a pretty VAD, Miss Mace. He was certainly her favorite charge, and she was certainly the pet VAD of all the officers. Her work was cut out to divide her favors. <laughs> so much subtext. In addition to the dancing lessons I gave these men, I assisted a little in the restorative work of the home by taking them each in turn to Regent's Park in the early mornings to row on the lake. Ah, 
All right, so a bit of cross training there. Seems rowing and ballroom dancing have something in common. You can cross train. I didn't realize that. We did the journey on a tandem bicycle and how they used to play me up when I had to pause at the top of Portland Place for the traffic in the Marlebone Road. My only method of stopping was to put a foot on the ground and regularly every morning, their great joy was to pretend that they would not help me. Boys will be boys. Many of my weekends were spent at Sir Arthur Pearson's home at Hove, and I would take in the blind officers uh, riding on the downs. Oh, that's pretty awesome. One of my charges, called Jerry, delighted in the constantly escaping from me and riding madly away into the horizon. <laughs> was he blind doing that? That's that's fucking awesome if he was. Can you imagine that? He's just like, yeah, I'm going to mess with you. Check this out. He's just like, cannot see. He's like, yeah, just a leap of, we call that riding with faith. At first, I followed him with terror in my heart and grim visions of his horse hurling itself as its ride and its rider over the cliffs. But I soon lost the fear when invariably found the old hired hack busily eating grass along the hedges. <laughs> Having safely carried Jerry without mishap, owing to the fact that these horses knew every inch of the ground, every blade of grass on the downs. Yeah. Yeah, that was a very cool calculator prank. Sir Arthur himself never joined our riding expeditions. For this, I was really thankful because his... In spite of his charm and good looks, I was very frightened of him. Yeah, his name was Sir, that's why. The evenings, oh, sorry, he was an intensely vital person and always talked with extreme rapidity, which my brain could not combat. The evenings when I was placed at his right-hand side at dinner were sheer agony. I used to think, what a stupid girl he would consider me. Of course, now I realize he probably never gave me a thought. That's right, he was a Sir. He did not. How many of the agonies of youth are caused by youth wondering what other people think of them? Did you hear that, youth of today? How many of the agonies of youth are caused by youth wondering what people think of them? Ha! Comparison. Stay tuned. I've got some episodes coming up on that game. Help you out a little bit. But yeah, people are thinking about you. Don't worry about it. I can recall a number of amusing times with these officers, for instance. Uh, so I can remember a number of amusing times with these officers. For instance, we always had tickets for the fancy dress balls at the Albert Hall. And um, by the way, the Albert Hall is still where one of the very top championships to this day is run. So Blackpool's prestigious dance festival, but the Albert Hall. Oh, this is this is right up there on par with the iconicness, and it's uh, it's it's a very a a coveted event to get into, and you have to uh, make it through s round subsequent rounds to be, I think, in the top ninety six. To, to dance in the round uh, floor of the Albert Hall, okay? So it's not a square. But I remember an episode which was not at all amusing. One night, when we were returning from one of these balls, I realized by his erratic driving that the chauffeur was drunk. <gasps> Naughty. I did not like to impart my nervousness to my blind companions. Crossing Duke Street at the rate of about 50 miles an hour, I foresaw an impeding crash with a taxi which was passing down Oxford Street. And sure enough, we hit it broadside. We were thrown violently on top of one another, but the car, being a large limousine, were all intact. So this is, yeah, was it Volkswagen that invented the seatbelt? Yeah. So I, I think. Anyways, if they did, th this is definitely pre-seatbelt days. And a drunken chauffeur, I I just thought he would always be drunk driving. Maybe he went too fast now. Pulling myself, to, and by the way, don't drink and drive like that. It's retarded. So pulling myself together, I got out, fully expecting to find the dead body of the taxi driver mixed up in the wreckage of his vehicle. This is this is getting spicier. Not so. I was never more relieved to hear the irate voice of a taxi driver giving tongue. Okay. Right. That's what it's... So he was cranky, but he was giving tongue, a tongue lashing to the other, other person. Poor Sir Arthur had to pay something like 400 pounds. That's a lot of money. A large price for his chauffeur's lapse in sobriety. That's true. Um, that's a fairly, what, what is what is 400 pounds? I'm going to check this out just real quick. Uh, in 1940. Yeah, we'll just check that out. Let that load, let that load. Um, well, that is actually the end of the chapter, ladies and gentlemen. Can you believe?